The views and opinions expressed on this show are solely those of the host and guest and are not necessarily supported by WPSC 88.7 FM, station management, or the station owner, William Patterson University. Anyone wanting to offer differing opinions may do so by calling the show at 973-720-2738. Abusive callers will be rejected. Now here's your program on WP 88.7 FM Brave New Radio. Well, good morning, good morning. Good morning to you. And yes, here is your program on WP 88.7 FM Brave New Radio. I apologize that we're running a couple of minutes behind schedule. As you know, many times I tell you I'm the first show of the morning and I have to be escorted in by the police because the building is actually locked. So whenever I get here early on Saturday mornings, I actually have to call the university police and they come over and they graciously open the door for me but every now and again things are running a little bit late and that is the case this morning so we are going to get started more importantly or most importantly my guest is already on the line and that's always a good thing whenever the guest has already called in because i'm not sitting here like on pins and needle wondering if my guest is going to call in so i am going to go ahead and give you the weather i'm going to read from my two books and introduce my guest and we will resume and continue on so let someone know you know the drill listening audience get on all your social media sites and let someone know that the reading circle is indeed on the air on wp 88.7 fm and gobrave.org right now our temperature is believe it or not 28.8 degrees we're actually getting a little taste of winter here in the spring we can expect today to have rain showers early that will evolve into a more steady rain for the afternoon. We may even have a snow mix. We're looking at a high of 41 and a low of 24 cloudy skies tonight. Then tomorrow, Sunday, generally sunny despite a few afternoon clouds. High near 50, low of 37, some cloudy skies on Sunday night. And then on Monday, cloudy with showers. High of 57, low of 48, considerable cloudiness on Monday night. Tuesday, cloudy with periods of rain, high of 54, low of 34, rain showers on Tuesday night as well. And then on Sunday, it warms back up again with 58 degrees as a high, 35 degrees as a low. Sunny along with a few clouds clearing up on Wednesday night. Again, high of 58, low of 35. Well, that is the weather brought to you right here by the WP 88.7 FM Weather Center. As you know, if you've been listening for any amount of time, I start off reading from two different books. One is Until Today by Ayan Van Zant, and the second is by Joyce Meyer, The Power of Being Thankful, 365 Devotions with the Power of Being Grateful. So for today, April the 9th, access to God. In whom, because of our faith in him, we dare to have the boldness, courage, and confidence of free access and unreserved approach to God with freedom and without fear. Everything about our spiritual lives depends on our personal faith in God and our personal relationship with him. We can enjoy that relationship because Jesus' death on the cross gives us free, unhindered access to our Heavenly Father, and our faith makes it possible for us to have an intimate dynamic relationship with him. Thankfully, we as ordinary human beings have free access to God at any time through prayer. It is exciting to know we can approach the creator of the universe boldly without reservations, without fear, and with complete freedom. God loves you and wants a personal relationship with you. How awesome is that? Personal faith in God opens the door to unlimited health from him. Prayer of thanks. Thank you, Father, that I can have a personal relationship with you. Today I come boldly before your throne of grace. With more than just requests and petitions, I come to you full of gratitude for all that you have done in my life. Again, that's the power of being thankful. 365 devotions for discovering the strength of gratitude. From the book... Until today by Iyanla Van Zant. Let's see what Miss Iyanla says for today, April the 9th. Or shall I say April the 8th? <laughs> I'm already at a day or so ahead of myself. Or is it the 9th? Let's see, what is today? Been running so much, don't even know what our days are here. But it is the 9th. April the 9th, I am willing to acknowledge there are things in my life that do not smell quite right. What does your life smell like? At first, it may seem like an unusual question. On second thought, 
the question will probably reveal to you some things you may have overlooked. If you were to take a whiff of your life, which response mechanism would be activated? A gag reflex? The laugh button? A sigh of relief or unspeakable joy? If you were passing by your life, what would you smell? A bed of roses or a gym locker full of sweaty socks? Perhaps some of grandma's home cooking? Or is it more like popcorn that has been left in the microwave too long? If you were to throw open the front door of your life, what would hit you in the face? The scent of carpet fresh or the stench of a moldy basement? The aroma of a cake that's just about done or the smell of trash that needs to go out? Most of us are very familiar with the way our lives look. Few of us has ever taken the time to make sure that our lives smell as clean as they look. Quite often, what our ears, eyes, and hands miss, our nose can detect. The sense of smell is also quite useful because it evokes memories. With a whiff of something, you can be thrown back into a memory of something that happened, how it happened, and whether or not you like what happened. From there, you are motivated to encourage or discourage the same thing from happening again in your life. Most important, the sense of smell evokes feelings. If something in your life doesn't smell right, you will not feel right. If you don't like what you feel, you know it is time to clean up. Until today, you may only have been concerned with the way your life looks. You may have ignored certain things you heard or saw, but you cannot ignore a smell. Just for today, be devoted to sniffing around your life. Be on the lookout for rotting things you need to discard and fragrant things you can put on display. Today, I am devoted to sniffing around all aspects of my life. And that's from the book Until Today by Ian LeVanzant. I open up the show reading from those two books to kick it off in a positive vein. And it does just that as they are positive messages. And the rest of the show flows. My guest who is already on the line is Sherry Meeks. She writes short stories as well as novels. And with her novel Finding Tambry. She combines both forms by creating a novel in stories. She received her MFA in fiction from Southern New Hampshire University. She lives in the Peachtree State of Georgia with her dogs, Abby and Skye, and is an instructor of creative writing. Sherry, welcome to the Reading Circle with Mark Medley. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm so happy to be here this morning. Oh, I'm happy to have you. So you're calling from Georgia. What part of Georgia? Macon. Um, it's about 85 miles south of Atlanta. Atlanta, absolutely. Well, our mother lives down there in Georgia as well. She's probably now about, mm, if you're 85 south of Atlanta, she's probably about three and a half hours from you because she's about two and a half hours from Atlanta in the northern part of Georgia in Louisville. So she's not too far from Augusta. She's about 35 minutes from Augusta. I do know where, where Augusta is, yes. Okay, so she's not too far from there. So she's in that state as well. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to share some information with the listening audience, and then we're going to get started with our interview. Because the, the book is Finding, is it Tambry? Is that how you say it, Tambry? Exactly right. Finding Tambry. You got it. Finding Tambry. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And Tambry is the name of a person? It is. Okay, good. So we're going to talk about all of that whenever we resume our interview. Listening audience, you know the deal. You are to get on all your social media sites and let someone know that Sherry is on the air with me. We are heard around the world on GoBrave.org and locally here in northern New Jersey on FM Radio WP 80.7 FM. child, it's just something else to play with. Lock it up, because 1.7 million children in the U.S. are living with unlocked and loaded guns. Get involved at ceasefireusa.org. If you own a gun, you have a full-time responsibility. When you aren't using it, 
be sure it can't get into the hands of curious children, troubled teenagers, a thief, or anyone else who might misuse it. Your family, friends, and neighbors are all counting on you. Remember, always lock it up. For more information on firearm storage safety, visit ncpc.org. This message brought to you by the National Crime Prevention Council, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and the Ad Council. The Reading Circle on WP 88.7 FM. That is correct. This is The Reading Circle with your host, Mark Medley. We come to you live each Saturday morning from 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock. And then every now and again, and what has happened more recently, we've had a lot of Reading Circle doubleheaders. That's where we have two guests. So I may have a guest in the 6 o'clock hour and a guest in the 7 o'clock hour. And then, rarely... But we sometimes have a Reading Circle triple header where we have a guest in each hour. But this morning, my guest is on the line, as I said, calling all the way from Georgia, and that is Sherry Meeks. All right, Sherry, let's go all the way back to the beginning. And I see that you are an instructor of creative writing, so I have some assumptions that I'm making, but they might be wrong. Where did the writing begin? Is it something you did as a child? Is, did you love it always in grammar school, or, or did it start later in life? Well, I always loved um, reading, for sure, and I think it started from there. But definitely, I did write some um, growing up, and then it developed more um, when I became an adult. And I knew that it was something that I wanted to do, even though, you know, I worked different jobs. And um, for the longest time, you know how you feel like you need to do the thing that you're passionate about. And finally, um, I went back to school. I I continued to write. In fact, I started the book, this book in a creative writing class, and then I went back to college to get my master's, and the thesis was my book. And then after, after I finished school, I polished it up, and so that's how the book came about. And, but I've always, always loved writing, and I think it's just, you know how something kind of nags at you constantly when you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, and, and now I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, and, and it makes me very happy. I know that feeling of something nagging at you whenever you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing because I did a career change about 15, 16 years ago now where I actually was in corporate American business and my heart and love was always in education. And so I was pulled that way and ultimately made the change and it's been wonderful ever since. So I know exactly what you're talking about. And you hit on something else that's very important and that was being an avid reader as a child. One of the the reasons that this show came about was because it was to encourage people to read more. And what I have found over the 15 years that I've been on the air is many of our, not all, but many of the guests that I have on who are authors were avid readers as children. Mm -hmm. And generally the reading and the writing goes together. Yes. Did you write short stories or poems or, or keep a journal or something whenever you were a child when you were in school? Uh, mostly, um, it was different things. Uh, I did have journals from time to time. I would, you know, keep up with a journal from time to time. But I think I mostly wrote short stories, and I would um, occasionally try a poem now and then. And I've actually started writing more poetry now, which is odd because it's not something that I've normally done a lot of. But yes, and it's always um, I always love my English classes and my literature classes. Um, and just, just I tried different things to see what I like to write, but I've found that short stories are what I love, um, and also novels. So with this one, I put the two together. And what I'm working on after Tambry is actually um, just a normal novel as opposed to a novel in stories. Um, the one I'm working on now is called May and Mish. Now you got kind of, you. That was a great segue into my next question in terms of defining what's the difference between a novel and a short story. What defines the difference? A short story, um, well, length is one thing, and um, the it, usually it's just the length. And one thing with a short story too, you have to be um, very precise with. Um, not that you don't have to be in the novel, but you have more um, more ground to work on those characters, and um, you might be able to get give a little more information on the characters. But with a short story, you have to be very concise um, and get as much information across as you can in those, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 pages. Um, but with this, the, all the short stories come together to make a novel. So you could um, technically read the third story out of sequence, and it would make sense. 
um, but they're meant to be um, read in order. So Finding Tambry mm-hmm. is a collection of short stories? Mm-hmm. But together, they read as a novel. Ah, so when you, when you read the, the various short stories together, it reads as a novel. That's this exactly. is a story of Tambri, T-A-M-B-R-I, a mm-hmm. woman who suffers the loss of her young son and the disintegration of her perfect marriage to her high school sweetheart, Daniel. Although Tambri retains her sense of humor, she struggles with feelings of loss and guilt and not being good enough for this world. Tambri discovers one wrong man after another, and her only condition is that each man doesn't have children. I will not go through that again. Follow Tambri on her journey to find herself. Before we get into Tambri, I'm going to go back a little bit more again in terms of you said you always wrote short stories. Where did that come from? Where did the stories come from? You know, it's a, that's, that's a, a good question. Um, just about anywhere. It's so, it's so interesting how, you know, an ideal will come to you just seeing something that's unusual or hearing, overhearing a conversation or just something that has happened during your day and later on the day you might think about it and it makes you think of this you know a start to a story and sometimes you know I use different tools because I do teach creative writing so I I love to use the the tools that I teach my students sometimes I'll do free writing just to see which is you know you just put pen to paper or you can do it on the computer and you just write for a set amount of time without stopping and a lot of times with that something will come up through the free writing that you never imagined um, and there's the start of a story um, so so many different places um, and when you really start to write you'll notice that ideas are everywhere and it's just it's just amazing when you do you're in that mindset and you you, you think well let me write this one down because that's another idea for a story Based on what you just said, do you ever get into a situation where, I know they have things called writer's block, or do you ever get into a situation where you're now trying to force the process and nothing comes? You know, I try to um, avoid that uh, as much as possible. And I've never had writer's block. Um, and I think, um, because I do have the tools that I teach my students, you know, there's always a different way to... If you do find, if I do find I'm struggling with something, I'll try something different. Um, you know, I might even write a writing prompt, you know, some kind of sentence to start it off. Or I might come up with a few words that I want to put into the story. It kind of helps me find that path to the story. Um, but I've never really had writer's block, and I try my best not to force a story because if you do, the story is going to be stilted and, and the reader is going to know it. So I try, you know, as much as I can and and really to relax more into the process and let the process flow. And also you have to work on it constantly, Um, but let the process flow. And then the the work is more organic. Right. It it doesn't feel stilted and it feels um, natural. And the process itself is a lot more fun if you if you don't force it. And you actually come up for me. I come up with a, a better story usually when it's not forced. Absolutely. Now, is Finding Mm -hmm. Tamara your first published book? It is. It is. Yes. Okay. I'm excited. (laughs) I am sure. I can only imagine. And there's there's one question that I ask just about every week at some point in the interview, and I'll be getting there shortly. I won't ask it now, but it's dealing, it'll deal with that excitement. We are going to share some more information with the listening audience. Listening audience, you know what to do. That is your prompt to get on your social media sites. I just did it. I just went on Hootsuite, put it out there again that Sherry's on the line with me. That goes out to all my social networks at one time. It's great to be able to put it in one place and it goes out to everything. But I just did that and I'm going to do it again. I ask that you do that with whatever vehicle that you use in terms of social media. Let somebody know to get up. Turn on their computers, go to gobrave.org, or if they're in the northern New Jersey or in the New York area, they can get on the radio, WP 88.7 FM. Hey, parents of children with asthma, here's another hit from the Breathe Easies. Don't smoke in the house. Smoke 
Preventing asthma attacks can be as simple as making your home and car smoke-free zones. For more Breathe Easy tips to help stop asthma attacks, go to noattacks.org. Brought to you by the EPA and the Ad Council. Check her out. Let me oh, at you. man. I like that. When young men turn 18, they think they know a lot about the facts of life. But there are a few more facts they need to know. Fact, you have to register with Selective Service when you turn 18. It's the law. Fact, registration keeps you eligible for government jobs and student loans. Fact, it's easy to register. Just visit sss.gov or any post office. Register with Selective Service when you turn 18. It's the law. And that's a fact. You're listening to The Reading Circle with Mark Medley on Brave New Radio. You are listening to The Reading Circle with Mark Medley. My guest this morning is Sherry Meeks, and we're working our way up to talking about her novel, a collection of short stories, Finding Tambry. Now, this fascinates me from the standpoint of how things generally tend to work in terms of the universe or God or however we call that force that's way beyond us. And I'm saying that, Sherry, because my guest last week, one of my guests was Mark Anthony, the psychic lawyer. And oh, wow. what, okay. what okay. Mark does, I don't know if you've heard of Mark or not, but um, he's been exposed on all types of media. But what he does is he's able to communicate with the spirit world. Okay. okay. And one of the things, one of the topics we talked about was parent losing a child. And how difficult that is. And, you know, I'm reading his book at the moment and he gets into how, you know, that the child from the other side now that it's passed on has the opportunity to communicate through him with the parents. And it's just always interesting to see how the child is always telling the parents, I'm OK, I'm fine over here. It's great. And actually, that's what they're in, But it's very hard for the parents on this side because right. he, I was I actually went to a, a a presentation of his last night in New York. He was in the New York area, and he asked me to come out. And I was like, "Sure, great. I'll you know I'll come out since, since you're close." And he made a quote last night that, let me see, I'll paraphrase it. But what he was saying was, "Death is only is not sad for the one who dies. Death is only sad for those of us who are left behind." So the one who dies is not sad for them because they go over to the other side. And from what I understand from him and reading so many other things and researching so many other things, it's great. So yeah. when I saw your synopsis about mm-hmm. now this is a woman who has lost a child, yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, this fits right in. This is almost like a continuation from last from week. Life. And <laughs> the universe, so it, the it, universe it, it, it really is. Finding Tambry is a haunting exploration of the aftermath of losing a child. These stories have true emotional depth and staying power. Over the course of this fine book, our hero emerges as a psychologically complex character, a woman who holds crushing grief at bay. That was one of the reviews. And see, again, that's what the, the two books written by Mark, Evidence of Eternity and never letting go and that's what his books deal with this same so these dovetail real nicely it's a nice continuation all right so you've you've written you read as a child you've written in high school you Mm -hmm. continued on you went to school to get the masters in it you're teaching Mm -hmm. creative writing when did you decide because i know you said this was part of your thesis yes finally so when did you decide you know i want to make a book out of this um i just i knew i wanted to write a book and I had started one of the short stories, like I said earlier, in a creative writing class, and it was actually about, that first short story was about one of her husbands, one of Tambry's husbands, and I realized Tambry was the main character, and I had a feeling that it was going to turn into a novel, and so when I started school, when I started my master's, um, I knew that that would be the story, and and I knew I wanted to, it's so interesting how things work out, but I knew I wanted to do it um, in short stories. And I knew I wanted to do each chapter in first person. And that was influenced. The reason why I did that, every chapter is in first, or every story slash chapter is in first person. Tambry tells about half the stories, and then her friends and husbands tell the rest of the stories. And, you know, we're talking about reading, and I know um, the book that influenced me to write it from different points of view was William Faulkner, As I Lay Dying. And each of those chapters, the first time I read that book, each of those chapters is told from a different perspective and first person. And I know so many years later that that influenced me with this book, wanting to do that. Um, and it's, 
is so interesting how some things just kind of, you know, stick with you. And and I remember thinking, I didn't know, I don't, I didn't know you could do that at the time. That you could do, you know, different chapters from different um, characters' points of view. And so that fed into the book as well. And it just, um, it just kept rolling. And it finally, um, you know, it finally turned into a rough draft. When I, you know, I finished with it, it was still a rough draft. And then I polished it, and, you know. Is so. Um, it's just an interesting process, Mark. The way things work, and you know, it's, it you're talking about the universe and, and God and that kind of thing. It's it's really what you put out there, and right. you know, those positive vibes. And if you work towards it, and if you think you're going to do it, I mean, everything will work together for you. And that's definitely what happened with this novel. So now, do you run into a situation when people read it, do they ask, is that you? Is Tambry Sherry? Or- they do all the time. In fact, when they buy it, because they'll read the back of the book when I'm, if I'm at Barnes & Noble or something like that. But it's not. It's, I've, I've never been married, and I don't have kids, so it's totally fiction. Um, some of the characters are based on people that I know. I mean, certain characteristics of the characters. But it's totally fictional, and, and that's the fun of it because I didn't know that it was going to end up when I wrote that first short story, I didn't know that it's going to, was going to end up that Tambry had lost a child, but you start writing and then the story kind of presents itself to you and you rework it and rework it until you see this shape of a novel, um, which is really cool. So now where did Tambry come from and where did such a name such as Tam, because that's different. Tambry is a different, it's pretty by the way, but it's, that's a different name. And, and so where did, where did Tambry come from? And then talk to me a little bit about how do you do your character development? I've heard various uh, okay. descriptions of how authors do their character develop. Some de- development rather, some of their characters actually walk, talk, eat, sleep with them. Some of them are at bay. Um, I've heard such stories where the, author went down one road and was going to actually kill a character off and fell in love with the character and couldn't do it and had to rewrite the story. And So talk to me a little bit about your character development. Okay, sure. Well, Tambry, the name, I actually made it up. I knew I wanted to try my best to come up with a different kind of name. And and somehow I'd met a lady called Tambi, and I said, no, that's not quite it. And so um, then I came up with Tambry from there. So that's how the name came about. Um and character development, it, it's usually different. Um, if I'm struggling with a character, a lot of times I'll do a character sketch. I'll, um, you know, write down the hair color and um, how tall and what type of clothes this person wears and what they eat for breakfast and, you know, who are their brothers and sisters, whatever comes up if I'm finding that I'm struggling with creating a character. And some, so sometimes it's that way. Sometimes it's, um, writing in first person from the character's point of view, the character kind of reveals um, his or herself to you. Um, and then other times, um, it's just a conglomerate of things. It might be um, somebody that you know and you know you want to kind of base a character on that, and, and one of the characters is, is based on my cousin. Um, his name is Clay. He's a truck driver, and he's one of Tambry's husbands in the book. Um, but, but he's based somewhat on my cousin. I knew I wanted to give him those He's a tall guy, kind of a big guy, and I wanted to give him the characteristics that my cousin has. So it's interesting. You do, you know, there's different ways to come about um, to create these people. But you're absolutely right, Mark. Once you, once they're fully developed or, or almost fully developed, you really do start to think of them as somebody that you know almost. Because I'll, you know, during the process, I'll talk to people. You know, my sister especially, I'll say, you know, Tambry wouldn't do this or Tambry would do this and and they do they become they become almost real which is what you want because it really it really breathes life into those characters now in terms of teaching your creative writing class yes you have the opportunity to stand now in front of your class with a published work I mean I'm looking at the cover and everything the colors and the butterfly which I'm gonna ask you about in a couple minutes as well what is it like now whenever you stand in front of your students and you can produce that for them because now you're not telling them what you think you're telling them what you know and a product that you've produced what is it like for them um I think they're I think they're excited for me and and that's what I'm finding going on the book tour and that kind of thing if you if you stand there with a positive vibe just like I was saying before 
and you say, and a lot of times I'll say, you know, look what I've done. You can do the same thing. Right. And I think people appreciate that. Um, and I really do think that if it's something that you want to do, even if it's not writing, if it's wanting to go into corporate America, right. you know, the reverse of what both of us did. But if that's something somebody wants to do, I really think you can, anybody can do just about anything they want to do if they put their mind to it. So I think the thing that they take away from it is that you can do just about anything you want to do if you put your mind to it and you you know you're positive about it and you work toward that goal i think that's the main thing they take away absolutely i'm going to share mm-hmm. some more information the last break you know in this part of the interview or in this hour and then we're going to continue on and we're going to keep on talking about finding tamri and your other work and you're absolutely right one of the reasons i ask the questions that i ask is because a good number of those in the listening audience are kind of teeter-tottering Mm-hmm. Or either they've been wrestling with this, do I write a book, do I not write a book? You know, right. I, do I, and, and a lot of times when they hear the author on the air kind of go explain what they went through and so on, they finally get off the fence and say, you know what, if Sherry can do it, I can do it too. And it's so, a lot. Yeah, right. So you hit on that in terms of just like with, with your class. And that's exactly one of the things that I hope happen when folks are listening to the show. A, I hope they go out and buy the book. Or shall I say A is I hope they read more, period. I don't care what they read. Secondly, or B is I hope they go out and buy the book and read that book. But C, if you are one that is struggling with should I write, should I not write, I hope this show encourages you that, hey, I can do this. And go ahead. And a lot of times I'll ask process type questions. As a matter of fact, when we come back, I will ask you a few process questions in terms of how did you go about now moving it from your thesis into a published work did you self-publish did you go to a publishing house so forth and so on so let me share this you know what to do folks get on all your social media sites and then when we come back we're going to talk a little bit about the process and a few other things in terms of finding tamri the following is a certified announcement from a wpsc producer hello my name is nick gomez producer for the brave babes here on brave new radio After joining the show just a few days after its first air date, I quickly learned what the next couple of months would have in store for me. By all means, I do not want to paint these ladies in a bad frame. They are well-mannered, respectful, You think so? And agreeable. Excuse me! (laughs) No, no, no! What I'm saying is, if I'm brave enough to work with them, you're brave enough to listen. The Brave Babes, Thursdays from 7 to 9 p.m., only on Brave New Radio. Looking for a change of pace in your boring radio routine? We have the answer. 15 hours, 15 bands, all live. April 22nd, 9 a.m. to midnight. brave 2016. Hosted by Brave New Radio and WPTV6. Want to expand your horizons? Want to broaden your mind? Well, listen to the only show of its kind. Listen to The Reading Circle. We bring you what's going on in the world of reading, in the world of books. Sometimes the book may be from 20, 30 years ago, because the thing about books, they are timeless, particularly if there's a good message. And then there are times when we do books that are hot off the press that were just released. Listen to The Reading Circle every Saturday morning from 6 a.m. The Reading Circle with your host, Mark Medley. Only on WP 88.7 FM. All right. Welcome back to The Reading Circle with Mark Medley. We heard, we are heard every Saturday morning from 6 o'clock a.m. Early on Saturday morning, the early bird gets the worm. Some information and knowledge is shared early on Saturday morning. So those of you... Those of you who are listening, thank you for rising early to join us. My guest this morning is Sherry Meeks, and we're talking about her book, Finding Tambry. So, Sherry, right before I shared the promotional information, mm-hmm. I asked you the question or said we would talk about a little bit about the process. How did you move from it being your thesis project to now being a published work? Did you self-publish or did you go through the tr- traditional route of sending out to a publishing house or how did it come about? Well, I uh, tried um, several times to have it published, and I had, and, and I think Mark that I was um, purposely, without realizing it, putting the wrong vibe out because I, I really wanted to self-publish, and I didn't realize it at the time um, because I, I wanted to own the work. Because when you publish with 
with a publishing house, it's not technically yours. Correct. Or anymore. So I think even though I sent quite a few out, I think, you know, I was sending out the wrong, you know, the wrong energy, which really was the right energy because I wanted to self-publish. So I did self-publish, and that's what I ultimately did. And the the stigma that's associated with self-publishing from years and years ago just isn't there anymore. That's correct. Um, because um, you can do it, and you can it it can be incredibly professional. And you know, I pulled in um, somebody from California to do the book cover, and. She did a wonderful job, and, you know, just going through the process of figuring out how to make it work, who you have to order the books from to get those books into Barnes & Noble and that kind of thing. The whole process um, was really just a, a, a cool trip, a cool ride figuring out the the way things work. And I think sometimes, you know, your your listeners, I think I know the feeling of before I started to do it, it feels like this heavy weight that you'll never figure out how to do it. But once you start, even the writing process, once you start and you make it somewhat of a habit, it becomes easier and easier. And, and when you learn what you have to do, whether it's writing or publishing the book, um, it just becomes easier over time. And it's worth that effort to figure out how to do it. And you brought up a very good point in terms of the stigma. Because, Mm -hmm. again, I've been on the air 15 years now. And in the first part of those 15 years, self-publishing really was kind of just getting off the ground. Mm -hmm. And there really was a stigma. I'm trying to think there was a couple of different variations of self-publishing. And the names of them will come to me. But... There was kind of like the unprofessional. And you know what? The sad part is many of the authors, it was almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy or either they fed into that stereotype or that myth because they really did put out some crappy work. Right. And, and what I'm saying with self-publishing, you really do have to go into it with the mindset of this is going to be just as professional, if not more professional than something yes. that came out of a publishing house. Yes. And a lot of times early on, People would just put anything out there for the sake of getting it out quickly and to have their name on a book cover. Mm-hmm. And what I that agree. did, right? And what that did was people said, "Well, you know, what? I'm I'm not buying that because and and it gave the whole self publishing industry like a black eye. Mm-hmm. And over the years, folks have really gotten better that you really almost can't distinguish the difference. You really can't. You really can't. It's, in fact, it's funny that you mentioned that because um, my sister had asked me. A while back, she said, well, how do you tell the difference between a self-published book and a, um, you know, one through a publishing house in the bookstore? I said, well, you can't really tell um, unless you know that it's a self-published book or if it really stands out, um, if it's poorly produced, like you were saying, you can't really tell if it's a well-done book. Um, there's no way to tell the difference. Not usually. No, there is. Now, I have had a situation because I'm a speed reader and I was I, I was trained in it. I've gone to classes on it. I've self-taught on it and I've read so much over my lifetime that reading I do it very quickly I can blow through books very quickly using the speed reading techniques and I'm sharing that to say when I get a poorly written book it's like having a bunch of speed bumps or either potholes because oh, I'm, wow. I'm, it, it, I'm cruising along and all of a sudden if there's a grammatical error or either a spelling error or something it like brings me to a grinding halt Yes. And it's almost like I have to like reorient myself to keep to get my speed back up again. So if, I, if I'm reading a book that has a lot of grammatical errors or spelling errors, it's hard for me. And so yes. that's what in the beginning, that's really what a lot of people were getting in the self-publishing. But over the years and with technological advances and, and people really began doing their homework, it has gotten so much better to the point, as we just said, you really can't distinguish between a self-published book and a book that's coming out of one of the major publishing houses now in terms of getting in a barnes and noble because i see on your website purchased through barnes and noble and i heard you mention it just ago that is not easy to get into talk a little bit about how did you get into barnes and noble because barnes and noble does doesn't take anybody and you have to have certain number of copies and it's a whole right. process just for them talk a little bit about that sure sure um we'll have a, a wonderful publicist named jennifer perry um with lone lone wolf communications um, she and I worked together to um, to get me into Barnes and Noble, and and it takes time. And but you don't have to have a publicist to make it happen. I don't want anybody to think um, that that has to be part of it. I do have a wonderful one, by the way. But you don't have to have a publicist. You can do it yourself. 
But the process was, for me, for, for this particular time, um, we went to several Barnes & Nobles, um, sent letters, um, but I went to the local person in Macon, where I live, and um, initially they said no, but over time, if you keep going back and keep going back and um, show them that, you know, you're serious about this and you, you mean this, they'll eventually let you in the door. And you just can't, um, and there's a quote that I've, I've, I've read, and I don't know who said it, but it's, it doesn't matter how many people tell you no. You just have to keep trying and, you know, be very nice and very polite about it. And we were, and um, eventually they let us into Barnes & Noble, and um, Cindy Daniel, who is with Barnes & Noble and Macon, is wonderful for having me there. And it was, and they made such a nice display at the front, and it was just a great time the first time that I was in that first Barnes & Noble, so that was the first one. And then what happens is then the doors start to open more easily to the next Barnes & Noble and the next Barnes & Noble because you've proven yourself. Um, and that makes total sense to me. They, they don't want an author that's going to come in there and maybe sell two books. And when I'm in the right. store, I make, make a point of talking to people and you know, let them, letting them know who I am. And a lot of times people get excited for me when I tell them it's my first book and, and that kind of thing. And it's just and it is a fun process. And you sell more books that way when you, you make it more of a, an, um, an attempt to connect with people. Absolutely. Exactly, as opposed to trying to sell your book. And so that's what happened. So, you know, I've sold um, well at each of these events, and so word gets around to the other Barnes & Nobles. And so then you start to go to more Barnes and & Noble, and, and that's what's happened. And it's great. <laughs> well, I'm sure it is. And yes. in terms of the cover, what's the significance, if there's any, of the butterfly? Because I'm into covers. I, I, as a reader, as a, a host of a show that is about reading, I almost like study covers. And I, there's always a hidden message. And in yes. some cases, not a hidden message. I mean, but there's always something more to it than just what the natural person would think in terms of just picking up a book and looking at it. What's the significance of the butterfly? Well, it's... It's funny that you asked me that because um, the person that did my cover, I had given her just inf quite a bit of information about the book itself, and she gave me several options. And one of the things she gave me was a butterfly, which was interesting because there is a hidden hidden meaning in that. In one of the um, stories, um, there is um, this little boy sees a butterfly um, flying around. Um, they have a bonfire going. And that the butterfly is actually a moth, but it represents Tambry. So um, the fact that the, um, the illustrator of the book or the, the cover artist came up with a butterfly, it's just another way that the universe works for you. Absolutely. Um, so when she came up with that, I was like, that's perfect. That's exactly what I want on the cover. And so that's the meaning. It actually represents Tambry. And the fact that she does, she... You know, she's already been changed by this tragedy, right. for one thing, and then she changes throughout the book um, into a butterfly, uh, you know, metaphorically. And then also the fact that there's a chapter where a butterfly slash moth represents Tambry. In terms of, and this is the question I was talking about earlier that I generally ask just about all my guests because I am fascinated. I am always intrigued by how the guest responds to this question and the okay. responses are always similar let at the same time they're not similar and i'll talk about that in a second but my question is especially since you self-published and you've made it to say a barnes and noble generally with and i would think with the publishing houses as well but at some point a delivery came to your door a box came to your door with finding tambry in it and your name is right there at the top of the butterfly sherry meeks what was it like for you when you opened that box and you held that final product in your hand? It, <laughs> it's still surreal, Mark. It's still surreal. Um, it, it was, you know, they send you a copy to proof before right. you order, you know, 500 copies. That's right. Exactly. So they send you that copy to proof. And first of all, I was so excited at how good the book looked it was just like wow wow you know and then it's it's finding tambry it's it's 
something that I created, and it was absolutely. It's, it's surreal, and it's just it's just a wild experience, and it's fun, and you know it it was you know. I'm still, you know, reeling from it in a very good way. And just I'm looking at my on my page now because you were talking about the Barnes and Noble events. I have those in front of me. Yes. In, in case. And I'm looking at the pictures and it's like, wow. And I have to tell you the funniest thing. This, this lady sent me the sweetest email the other day um, through my Facebook. But it really um, kind of got me. She was sitting in the Dallas airport. She had bought it from the book from me in Louisiana. And she was from Texas. And so she sent me this message saying how much she enjoyed the book. And she had just finished it in the Dallas airport. And the fact that the book is in Dallas, which I've never been to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and she's the lady sitting there in the Dallas airport with the book that I had signed and she had bought at a Barnes & Noble. That just really, it just, uh, it was just a wonderful feeling. And the fact that she took the time to send me an email or, you know, send a message through Facebook to say how much she enjoyed it. And, you know, she was so glad she met me. I mean, it was just, it's just, it's just been one great thing after another. I laugh because, and I say the answers are similar, but they're not similar because it's a feeling that I have yet to have anyone describe for me because you cannot put it in words. Right. And at the Mm -hmm. same time, the similarity is like you said, it's surreal. That's the, the, the similarity is this is real. And what's not similar is the fact that however the author tries to describe it, the words are not adequate enough to describe <laughs> that feeling of what it's like. Because like you just said, first off, this is something that's come through me. This is something mm-hmm. I had the opportunity to share with the world. There is a book now that's in Dallas, Texas, that I've never been to Texas. I exactly. mean, but yet. <laughs> exactly. But and yeah. in the same token, you are now in Texas because your name is there, your work is there. But that's the beauty of having published work. And I shared this with many of my authors, and I think I even shared it last week. That is part of your legacy, that 50, 60, 70, 80, now, 100 years from now, whenever we're six foot under and our spirits have moved on somewhere else, that book is still going to be here somewhere, whether it's in a library, whether it's in somebody's trunk, whether it's somebody's attic, whether it's somebody somewhere, that book is still going to be around somewhere. And that thought in and of itself is, is, is overwhelming as well. Have you ever picked the book back up? And now read through parts of it and say, I don't even remember writing that. That was that was was that me? Wow, this is good. I, have you ever had that feeling? Well, I do. I have because I'll, I'll do reading sometimes. And um, in fact, we did a reading in Asheville um, at Battery Park Book Exchange. And I read some and then um, some of the people that were part of the little celebration read some. And you're absolutely right. And one thing, Mark, that I think, too, um, is I feel like when you're in that creative process, whatever it happens to be, I do feel that you're closer to God, that you're closer to whatever, whatever you believe in, because you are in that creative process. Yes. I think that moves you closer to whatever you believe in. And also when you're in that state, when you're in that state of flow, you're at peace. So I think that has something to do with it too. The fact that you are closer to God or your source or whatever you call it. Yes. And um, it is interesting because you do, read it um, a few months or a year later, and you do, not that I have forgotten that I, that I wrote that part, but I do, the part is almost, almost new again. Right. And I do think sometimes, wow, how did I come up with that? But I do right. think it's because you do connect to that other part of who you are. I think the fact that you just said, wow, how did I come up with that, 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 that exactly. gets close. And, yeah, exactly. I, 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 exactly. and, and I can relate. Mm-hmm. And I know the listening mm-hmm. audience who listen on a weekly basis, I know they find what I share repetitive in some respects because my guest each week is a different guest. But I have that same feeling musically. Ah. And the music that I use background for the show is my own music. And wow. I, can, I can listen to my... I have two CDs released and I can listen to them just over and over. It just never gets tired for me. As a matter of fact, I hear them every Saturday morning because it's playing right now. But there are times whenever I'm listening to it, it's like, wow, I don't believe I played that. Like, wow, exactly what you just said. Wow, I actually played that. (laughs) So that's you're you're hitting right on it. Now, the next piece of that, not only of getting the book 
on your doorstep and opening the box, but to walk in that Barnes & Noble, because I'm looking at the displays on your website, Mm -hmm. to walk into Barnes & Noble and see a display like that with all your books sitting there, and I see the blue sign in the middle that says Barnes & Noble Events, Sherry Meeks. What was that like? Well, (laughs) that's a... That the first one was in Macon, and my mom was actually with me. I was just I just went to look for a poster. I was just thinking they'd have a poster up, and then they had this beautiful display with all the and you can see it because you're looking at the website. Yes, with all the books, and I could not believe it. And my mom and I were kind of we we're giggling like little girls because we we're so excited. <laughs> That's right. And, <laughs> um, you know, I took several pictures of it, and I just I was first of all I was so appreciative that they did that um and you know i told cindy several times the the crm for that barnes and noble and it just i mean it was incredible and i'm still looking at it now and i'm thinking wow that's but right that, to that that kind of trouble too just um it really touched me and then just having it there i mean it was it, it's just mind-blowing it really is yeah, it is. I mean, because I'm, I'm looking at that, and I like I said, wow, you know, you you walk because I share again, and and funny that you would talk about in 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 Georgia because a couple of years ago, and you were saying something earlier about how people are happy for you. A couple of years ago, I was in Georgia. I was visiting my mother, and we had gone to a local Walmart, mm-hmm. and we go into the Walmart and go into the book session section. Excuse me, and I'm sitting there with the various books of different authors that I've interviewed on the show. And I started getting excited and carried with it. Mom, I actually talked to this person. I know this author. I've had this author on the show. And I'm picking up three and four and five and six different books that's on the Walmart rack (laughs) of authors and people that I've talked to. And I got excited just from that. So I can't imagine what it's like you as the person now walking into the store and seeing your work displayed front and center. Right, right. It's just it. It amazes me every time. And I have to tell you this quick little story. We're talking about when you read when you're a child and write when you're a child and that kind of thing. I had this um, this uh, young boy come to my table. His mom was with him, and he's probably I think he said he was twelve. But um, he had seen the Barnes and Noble. I think I've met him in uh, Louisiana or Gulfport. I can't remember which one. But he had come specifically to see me because he writes. And not that he bought the book, because it's not a book for a kid. It's for adults because of the subject matter. Right. Um, but he just came by to see me, and I talked to him, in which I love that. you know. And the fact that I teach creative writing, you know, I really, the teacher came out in me, and it was like, yeah, you need to continue to write. That's right. <laughs> that this child, <laughs> me with his mom, was just, he was like, I saw you. And, you know, I could tell he was shy, but the fact that he had pushed himself to come talk to me, he said, I saw you on the Barnes & Noble website. And I said, you did? And he said, I found you through your website. And I saw you were going to be in Barnes & Noble and da 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 And it just amazed me how how you can, you connect with certain people. That's right. And this 12-year-old kid is standing there telling me that he wants to be a writer. And I'm like, yes, yes, you need to be a writer, you know. And it's just <laughs> a wonderful experience. It's it really is. And, you know, con- and me being in education, we're constantly saying, you know, in terms of the level of interest in reading and writing, all that is low. But I'm not quite sure if that's true or not. It seems that way. But on this, on the other hand, there is some excitement that's created around reading and writing for kids. And this show used to be on years ago. It was on Friday mornings from 6 to 7.30. And I was doing it on Friday mornings. I would leave the studio and go to my school where I was teaching. And in many instances, the guests would come live into the studio. And I would I would ask them, you know, what are you doing after we finish the interview? And oh, I'm going to get breakfast. I'm going to do Do me a favor. Come with me for a few minutes. Drop by my school with me. And I want you to meet my students. I taught language arts. Okay. Okay. Sherry, when I would take the author into the classroom and hold up his or her book, my kids would lose their mind. These are kids that I didn't think like reading. These are kids that I didn't think wanted to read. <laughs> but when that author came in there and they saw the author's picture or either the name on the book and they were kind of like doing that, I see the book, I see you, and you're standing in front of me live, it freaked them out. Yeah, they would yeah. lose their mind. So there is an interest in reading. There is an interest in writing and in authors and all of that. Like you said, if the connection is made. Yes. 
That's absolutely right. You're, if you got to say, oh, I've got another cute little story. Yeah, sure, you. please go ahead. <laughs> there's a, um, there's a friend of mine. He's Hispanic, and he came over with his, um, with his um, ex girlfriend and their son, and they had come from uh, uh, Nicaragua. Um, the the friend of mine lives here in Macon. Well, the son is he's eight. He had just turned eight. Well, uh, his his father had bought the book. Well, he gave the book to his son. So the son takes it to Nicaragua after the holidays. They come over for the holidays and shows it to the kids in school and says, I know the author. And I mean, you know, it's not even in Spanish. It's in English that he's showing this to to the kids at school. So I absolutely know what you're talking about. There is an excitement when it comes to, it's so funny, knowing the author or... Right. You know, it's, there is excitement there, and and it makes me more excited, and it makes me wa- want to write even more. No, it is. That's the energy that's created. You're right, and I think one of the things that excites me the most of doing this show is I've had the opportunity to meet some wonderful people. Even if we haven't met face-to-face and we had the opportunity to talk over the air or on the telephone like we're doing now, I have mm-hmm. over the years met some wonderful people in terms of in this industry of writing and reading and, and authoring and so forth and so on. It has been invaluable. I mean, like I said, and when you all come to the area, if you let me know, I try to make my way out to meet you like Mark was in New York last night. And I actually went to his presentation over in New York. And I mean, it is just a phenomenal to have the opportunity to one meet and talk with you all to have your book to read your book it gives a whole different for those who are reading and once you've met the author it gives a whole different perspective even as you're reading their book so now like if i if when i read finding tambry i'm gonna have a whole different perspective on it after having spoken with you live that's very true and yeah. so it, it is a totally different energy i want to ask you one more question before we get to the end of our interview and that is dealing with that subject matter was that difficult for you in terms of a parent losing a child because that's just out of the natural order of things you know generally we expect parent uh, children to bury their parents and not right. vice versa so how dealing with that topic was that difficult for you as you know or, or or did it challenge you or what what was that like dealing with that topic i think um part of the a new going into it mark that i, I wanted this to be about not so much about what had happened to the child. In fact, it never says in the book what has happened to him specifically. Um, and it's more about, which I think it made it a little less difficult because it is a tough subject. You're absolutely right. You don't want, I didn't want to um, make light of it in any way because it is such a heavy subject. And some people have suffered through this. So just the idea of thinking about somebody that had actually gone through this, yes, it was. A difficult subject um, but but the fact that it's fiction does help tremendously and what I wanted to um, what I wanted to look at was how somebody gets through this after and that's what this is about um, so the book actually starts after these bad things have happened after the child has died and after her marriage has fallen apart so it's Tambry's journey and one reason why it's called fan- finding Tambry she's trying to figure out who she is right. after after this tragedy so and and there's a lot of joy in the book and there's a lot of laughter in the book and so i think we find that with any you know tragedy that any of us have gone through as far as losing somebody there's always you always hopefully find laughter in something and tambry is definitely a, a survivor and she does keep her sense of humor which she read earlier and i think if this character didn't the book would be a totally different book and I think it would be incredibly somber but it's not it's not um, it's not a downer all the way through in fact there's lots of times where there's a lot of laughter in Tambry's life so all right. I think that helped with the with the heavy subject matter okay I need to change over into the new hour and then when we come back I'm gonna turn the mic over to you in terms of promotion and you'll be okay. able to say anything except the dollar amount so okay, you can say great. wherever you're going to be, any of your book signings, your websites, any type of way folks can get a hold of you, you can say anything except an actual dollar figure. But other than that, the mic will be yours. So I'm going to do what I need to do now, now that we're in the 7 o'clock hour. And then, like I said, when we come back, the mic will be yours. Thank you so much. 
Broadcasting live from Hobart Hall in Wayne, New Jersey. This is The Innovative. I think they're really unique. The Fearless. They have awesome variety. The Kick-Ass. I love Brave New Radio. The Sensational. I've never heard anything like it. This is the one and only Brave New Radio. WPSC, Wayne, New Jersey. On the radio, 88.7 FM. Online, gobrave.org. A tune-in radio station. Part of the William Patterson Broadcast Network. Straight from the WP 88.7 FM Weather Center, here's your local forecast. Right now in the Wayne, New Jersey area, we've creeped up to 29.7 degrees. We have showers this morning, becoming a steady rain during the afternoon hours. Ooh, snow, the S word may mix in. Hopefully it won't, but it may. 42 is a high, 24 is a low cloudy skies early, followed by partial clearing. It was a 70% chance of, of rain or snow during the day, 10% tonight. Then on tomorrow, Sunday, sunshine and some clouds high around 50, 37 as a low cloudy sky Sunday night. Monday, overcast with rain showers at times, high of 57, low of 48, cloudy with occasional showers Monday night. Then on Tuesday, cloudy with periods of rain, high of 54, low of 34. And then Wednesday, the sun pops back out again, mostly sunny skies, high of 58, low of 35. That is the weather brought to you right here from the WP 88.7 FM Weather Center. All right. Well, as promised, I'm going to turn the mic over to Sherry and Sherry has the opportunity to promote. And you were talking about Jennifer. Thank her because Jennifer was my contact for getting you on the show. And she kept in contact with me and I you know, reminded her on Thursday that today was our day and everything worked out. So thank Jennifer for me as well. And well, again, the mic is yours. All right. Thank you, Mark. Um, if people want to uh, go to my website. It's SherryLynnMeeks.com. It's S-H-E-R-R-Y-L-Y-N-N-M-E-E-K-S.com. Uh, and they can find my events there. They can also find, um, I'll be posting this uh, radio broadcast if I can get it from you, Mark. Oh, yes, um, you will. Um, and they can also find, I've been on um, a couple of TV shows if they want to look at those and some other podcasts and that kind of thing. And also my events, what I have coming up on uh, April the 23rd. From 2 to 5, I'll be at Barnes & Noble at the Claire Lane Center on San Jose Boulevard in Jacksonville, Florida. And then Saturday, April the 30th, I'll have an author event from 2 to 4 and 6 to 8 p.m. at the Barnes & Noble uh, Town Square at Biltmore Park in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, then in May, I'll be at the Chicago um, the Book Expo. Um, and I'll, I'll actually be a um, part of the new title showcase there, so I'm excited about that. And that's May 10th through the 13th. So if anybody is at Book Expo um, in Chicago, please come by my booth and or my table and see me. I would love to just say hello. Um, and also, as far as social media, people can follow me on Facebook, um, and it's sherry.meeks.9. They can also follow me on Twitter, at Sherry Meeks. Um, and that's pretty much it. All right. Well, I thank you for rising early to join me this morning. And you alluded to a recording. And if all the equipment worked like it should, which this morning it looked like it was, I will be <laughs> editing it. And I'll send you an MP3 link as well as I archive the show on my YouTube channel. So okay, it'll great. be there. You'll have the links that you can do whatever you want with them when you receive them. And again, I thank you for joining me. The book for those in the listening audience is Finding Tambri, T-A-M-B-R-I. The author is Sherry Meeks, S-H-E-R-R-Y-M-E-E-K-S. And again, I encourage, as always, go out and support our authors. Go out and get the book, Finding Tambri. So, Sherry, have a wonderful day, and we will be in touch. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Same here.